Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, starring William Ice. Good evening. This is William Ice. Probably only a handful of people ever heard of a man named Henry Rose Carter, a pioneer in a solitary struggle against overwhelming odds. And yet not really alone. There would be others, men who were unknown to him, but all would be working as a team to solve a baffling and terrible mystery. Sometimes it must have seemed to Dr. Carter that his efforts were in vain. Yet they led to one of the great victories of medical science. This is his story. Time, 1879. Place, the offices of Charles Best and Henry Rose Carter, two young doctors in Baltimore. Henry! Huh? You're going to place the floor for the rest of the afternoon? Until I find something better to do. Oh, you should have been a marathon walker, not a doctor. Well, marathon walking probably pays better than doctor in these days. But I never heard of a lame marathon walker. Well, pacing up and down the way you do can't be doing that injured leg of yours any good. Since we opened this office three months ago, you must have walked a good thousand miles. It's a wonder you haven't dropped from exhaustion. <laughs> well, if I do drop, at least you'll have one patient, Dr. Ray. I'd rather have a patient who can pay for my services, Dr. Carter. Terribly mercenary, Dr. Mm -hmm. Terribly hungry, Dr. Carter. <laughs> oh, you know, it's funny how we've changed since we got out of medical school. We were going to burn up the world, remember? We figured that all we had to do was to hang out our shingles, and immediately the office would be swarming with patients. Well, Charlie, our big mistake was to open an office here in Baltimore. Well, what's wrong with Baltimore? Nothing. <laughs> That's the trouble. Nothing's wrong. Everybody's too healthy here. Oh, I wouldn't admit this to anyone but you, Charlie, but I often catch myself hoping that a lot of them get sick. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean. Well, not seriously, you understand? Just, just sick enough to make them want to see a doctor. I tell you, I'm getting so desperate. Wait a minute. I think I heard somebody open the front door downstairs. Maybe it's a patient. Maybe it's a bill collector. Well, if it's a patient, we eat tonight. <laughs> if it's a bill collector, all three of us are in for a terrible disappointment. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Whitaker. Afternoon. Afternoon to you, too, Dr. Carter. No dinner tonight, Charlie. Mm. What's that? Uh, we were sort of uh, hoping you'd be sick. What? Well, I mean, well, the truth is, Mr. Whitaker, we still can't pay for the signs you painted for us. Oh, that's all right. No, it isn't all right. You painted those signs for us, and you deserve to be paid. As soon as we can afford it, well... I, I didn't come up here today to collect my money. You didn't? You mean you're sick? Well, Dr. Carter, get my thermometer. No, no, no. You don't understand. I ain't sick. Oh. No, sirree. Matter of fact, I never felt better in my life. Delighted to hear it, Mr. Whittaker. No, I just come up to show you this little item I read in this morning's paper. Knowing how things was with you fellas, I thought you might be interested. Oh, we're always interested in little items in the papers, aren't we, Dr. Carter? Uh, especially recipes. Well, I know what a hard time you two boys have had in making a go of it. Now, it says here that in Washington, they're giving an entrance examination for the post of assistant surgeon in the United States Marine Hospital Service. Well, uh, don't think we aren't very grateful to you, Mr. Whitaker, but Dr. Carter and I are going to try to... Henry. Henry! Assistant surgeon. That's what it says here. Yeah. Henry, you're not seriously considering this. Why not? In the Marine Hospital Service, a doctor must have more patience than he knows what to do with. I'd be able to put whatever knowledge I have to some use. With so much sickness in the world, it's criminal for a doctor to sit in his office with his hands folded, waiting for the world to come to him. If the sick won't come to the doctor, the doctor must go to the sick, Charlie. You're going to take this examination? Yes. Luckily, Washington isn't very far from here. Well, it's not a question of geography. It's a question of finance. <laughs> Where are we going to scrape up your train fare? Trains are for successful doctors, Charlie. But the good Lord takes care of his poorer children, too, by giving them feet. Give me my twin walking sticks, Dr. Vest. I am walking to Washington. Good 
Come in. Excuse me, sir. Yes, what is it? Well, I know this is a bit irregular, but I wondered if you could tell me if I passed the examination yesterday. The results will be posted on the bulletin board downstairs tomorrow afternoon at four. Weren't you told that? Yes, Colonel, but if possible, I'd rather not have to spend another night in the park bench. That is, if I fail the test. What are you talking about, Doctor? Well, what I mean is, if, if I failed, and you told me now, I could start back to Baltimore immediately. I could walk a pretty far piece of it before nightfall. Walk? Are you planning to walk from here to Baltimore? If I fail the examination, yes. It's not a bad walk, really. I got here on foot. I guess I can go back on foot. Um, what's your name, Doctor? Henry Rose Carter, sir. Henry Rose Carter? Well, I might have known. You recognize my name? I sure do. Let me congratulate you, Doctor. You turned in a brilliant paper. Necessity is the mother of brilliant papers. You passed with honors, Dr. Carter. What? And as long as I've broken my own rule about giving out the results before they're posted, I might as well tell you that you've already been assigned to a station. Really, I... I'm more than grateful to you, sir. Well, I don't know. Maybe you won't be when you hear what it is. It's a dirty, miserable job, Dr. Carter. Well, as long as it's a job and I can be of some help... Oh, you can help all right, but you won't be happy. After a few weeks of it, you might be wishing you were back in Baltimore. Do you happen to know what's going on in some sections of the South right now? No, sir, I don't. Yellow fever. There are places rotting with it. I've been down there, and I've seen it with my own eyes, and it isn't pretty. Epidemics never are. Yes, I know. We've opened our marine hospitals to the public. In some areas, they may have to declare martial law if it gets much worse. You're, uh, you're not trying to frighten me into turning down this assignment, are you, Colonel? I'm trying to give you the truth. Don't you understand, Dr. Carter? I'm giving you a chance to get out of this assignment. When do I leave, Colonel? All right, Lieutenant Carter. You leave as soon as possible. Thank you. Good luck. To Dr. Charles Vest, Baltimore, Maryland. Dear Charlie, just enough time to write and tell you to take my name off the shingle. Besides, it's Lieutenant Carter now. By some miracle, I passed the test, and I'm about to head south for yellow fever duty. Oh, I wish you could see me in my brand-new Marine Corps dress uniform, Charlie. The supply sergeant obviously thinks I'm going to grow two inches more in all directions. Enclosed, you will find three dollars for Mr. Whitaker. Now, if you don't need this money for food, please pay that wonderful and patient mind for a sign. As ever, Henry. Lieutenant Henry Carter reporting for duty, sir. Well, all decked out in a brand new uniform, too. Yes, sir. And raring to go, eh? Yes, sir. Well, you might as well know from the start, Lieutenant. There's no glory for the Marine Corps down here. Things that bad, Captain? You'll learn soon enough just how bad. You'll learn that we haven't enough doctors, enough nurses, enough beds. Enough knowledge to fight this epidemic. We haven't even enough coffins. You'll come to realize how little you know, how little anyone knows about Yellow Jack. You'll even learn how to watch a hundred people die in just one day. Hmm. Perhaps I shouldn't discourage you like this, Dr. Carter. Go on, sir. I was in your position once. I remember when I was first assigned to yellow fever duty, young and eager like yourself. Sure that I'd be a great help. I thought I'd work hard, study the symptoms, the disease, perhaps even find the answer. Another Louis Pasteur, at least. Uh, but this thing beats you. It baffles you at every turn. I believe there is an answer. There's got to be. If you want my advice, Doctor, I'd say put away your marine coat and those silly britches and mothballs. You'll surrender, too. Wait and see. Forgive me for not writing sooner, Charlie. I'm tired. Tired and defeated. After six long weeks of duty in this Marine hospital, I... 
I look back on Baltimore and our tough struggle there is something pleasant. The yellow fever epidemic and conditions here are beyond description, beyond hope. And I'm so tired, Charlie. This is the last ward we have to check tonight, Lieutenant. All right, Sergeant. All right. Let's go. Oh, I'm so tired. I'm beginning to envy some of the patients. Just take them lie down. That's enough of that. I never want to hear that kind of talk again. Look, sir, if you don't mind a suggestion, I think maybe you'd better skip the ward tonight and get some sleep yourself. Doctor. This place has started to affect you like the Doctor. others. Doctor. Sleep? I haven't had a night's sleep since the day I stepped into this nightmare. Doctor, help me. Doctor... Oh, it's that patient in bed 24. Right. Now have a look at him. Well, what for? He's a hopeless case. Captain Blaine told me to move him out tonight. Can't we have the decency to wait until he's dead first? We need the bed, Doctor. He's going to die anyway. Don't keep repeating that. Look, they're bringing in the patient who needs that bed right now. Well, just a minute, Corporal. <laughs> Why? Why, this is just a child. Burning up with fever, too. Hello. Who are you? I'm Dr. Carter. What's your name? Susan. That's a very pretty name. Uh, are you the doctor who's going to make me all better? Yes, Susan. All better. Then I... I don't have to be afraid anymore. How old are you, Susan? Nine years and four months. Nine years and four months. Oh, you won't let me die, will you, Dr. Carter, will you? Captain Blaine, I want to talk to you, sir. Oh, it's you, Carter. Come in, come in. Is anything wrong? I'd like to be relieved of duty. <laughs> I was wondering how long it would be before you'd ask. Don't have the disposition for this sort of work, is that it? I don't have the disposition to stand around and watch people die. We're not doing anything. We're just watching. God, I know exactly what you mean. I hate it as much as you. I've been on the verge of chucking the whole thing more times than I care to admit. But somebody's got to stay with these people. For no other reason than to show the poor devils that somebody cares. Caring isn't enough. We'll never beat this epidemic by sitting in a hospital and watching death roam the wards while we do nothing to prevent it. In the emergency ward, there was a little girl, a, a little girl named Susan, aged nine years and four months. She said, are you the doctor who's going to make me all better? What do you say to a nine-year-old child who asks you that, Captain? What did you say, Carter? I'll tell you. I said, yes, yeah, sure, I'll make you all better. Nothing to it. Dr. Carter will take care of you, my child. You have nothing to worry about. That was... That was two days ago. Tonight, they're burying her. Better take something for those nerves, Doctor. Don't worry about my nerves. Worry about those people out there. What do you want me to do? What can anyone do? He can relieve me from duty here in the hospital. Let me go out into the city and, and try to learn something about yellow fever. Give me permission to comb the city, wade through its garbage heaps. Make tests of its drinking water, question its inhabitants, the healthy as well as the sick. I want to gather every pertinent fact, every drop of evidence. Do you think you'll find a cure for yellow jack that way? At least I'll be trying, not just looking on. I can't promise you anything other than the... Strenuous attempt. All right. Go ahead, Carter. And I hope you can prove something by your search. Well, I hope so, too. Others have failed, but if I can solve some of these mysteries, even one little piece of this horrible riddle, I'll feel my search has been useful. Good luck, Lieutenant. And, uh, oh, Carter, you'd better drag that Marine uniform out of the mothballs and wear it. What for? From now on, you're going to be a real doctor again. You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring William Ice, and sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. We continue our DuPont play. 
In the sweltering heat of the next few weeks, Dr. Henry Rose Carter became a familiar figure limping through the city's most infected areas during an epidemic of yellow fever, asking questions, collecting every scrap of information, making notes, constantly exposing himself to Yellow Jack. Yes? What is it? My name is Dr. Carter, madam, and We I... don't need no doctor. Go away. Wait a minute. Have there been any yellow fever cases in this family? Go away. My husband died of it last week. Clean up my backyard. What for? There's a lot of garbage and filth back there, sir. It's my property, in it? Yes, sir, but all that filth may be breeding the disease. You never can tell. How do you know that? I don't. It's just a theory. Well, instead of going around telling people how to live, why don't you doctors try to save some folks from dying? Now get off my property. Tell me the patient's age. Nineteen. And he came down with a fever. Six days ago. Last Friday. Do you know if, if he came in contact with anyone with yellow fever the week preceding last Friday? It's hard for me to remember. You must try to remember. It's very important. Oh, I, I don't think so. Why can't you leave me alone? Did he do anything unusual that week? Go, go any place he'd never been before? No, no. Is there any other piece of information you haven't told me? He died this morning. Now, is there anything else you'd like to know? August 26th. I make the following... Observations in this notebook with the full realization that I have as yet found no answer to the riddle of yellow fever. However, I'm putting them down in the fervent hope that they may be useful to that man who will one day solve this mystery. For one thing, I've noticed that the disease seems to flourish in congested areas, particularly in those places near stagnant water. Warm climate is also a factor. Interestingly enough, the disease does not seem to be contagious. Come in. Are you Dr. Carter? Yes. I was told to see you. They said if there was anyone in this whole town who could help me, it was you. Well, that depends on what you want, Mr. Johnson. Fred Johnson's my name. Sit down, Mr. Johnson. Well, thanks. You see, Doctor, it's about this yellow jack that's going around that I want to talk to you about. All right, go ahead. Well, I come all the way down here from the north because I was offered a good job. I brought my wife and two kids. We were all pretty happy about the whole thing until... Well, until we got here and found out that the city was rotten with Yellow Jack. If I could afford it, I'd clear out of town tonight right away, but... It took every cent we had to get here. Now, I'm stuck, Doctor, stuck here with my family. No money and... In the middle of an epidemic, I'm scared. We're all scared, Mr. Johnson. You're supposed to be a doctor. Can't you tell me what to do? There must be some way. Certainly, there must be some way, but we don't know it yet. We haven't any sure way of preventing this disease. All we have to offer is a few unproven theories. Mr. Johnson, are you willing to offer your family as guinea pigs? Well, I'm desperate enough to try anything you want. Good. Be a newcomer's here. I can be almost certain that neither you nor any member of your family has a disease. Oh, no, sir. Now I want you to go home... And tell your wife and children that under no circumstances are they to leave the house for the next few weeks. All right. They must come in contact with no one. Lock them in the house. Keep it spotless. Boil every drop of water. And no one must be allowed to come near them. Even you, Mr. Johnson. Find yourself a room. Still up, Carter? Still up. Come on in, Captain. Hard to get to see you anymore. How are things going? Here in the hospital, I mean. You know as well as I. Yes. Carter, i got something to talk to you about. Yes? I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to give up your... this field work. I, what? We need you back here at the hospital. 
But, Captain, I've, I've hardly begun to scratch the surface. A thing like this takes time. I know, I know. And we can spare everything in this epidemic but time. Conditions are worse than ever here, and we need every available hand. Look, Captain, I, I'm working on a case now, uh, an experiment that might give us part of the answer to yellow fever. Dr. Carter. Johnson, what are you doing here? Come quick, Doctor. My little boy's running a fever. Well, Doctor, I'm afraid it's what we suspected, Mr. Johnson. Yellow fever. I thought so. Are you sure all my instructions were followed? What difference does that make now? It makes a big difference. This is a test case. It may seem cruel for me to be bothering you with questions now, but I, I've got to know. Please think. Did you follow all my instructions? Doctor, as, as far as I can remember, we did everything you wanted. We boiled the water. I never come near the family. Nobody did. The front door ain't been opened since that first night I come to your office. I kept them as isolated as possible. But what good did it do? Tell me, doctor, what good did it do? What good did it do? September 19th. Further observations on the communication of yellow fever. Bobby Johnson, aged 11, tonight was stricken with a disease. For the three-week period the boy has been in this area, he's been kept in strict isolation. Nevertheless, he is now a victim of the disease. This case, I think, proves conclusively that the disease is not a contagious one, nor do I believe that it's carried bacteriologically through the air. In consequence, I now firmly believe that there is some other means, some intermediate host, which transfers the disease from the sick to the unafflicted. Some intermediate host. Get away! Get! Confounded mosquito. Signed, Dr. Henry Rose Carter. These and all of Dr. Carter's observations were to be carefully noted by other researchers and scientists. Specifically, Dr. Walter Reed. And as the world knows, it was this great medical scientist who in Cuba in 1901 discovered that a mosquito carried yellow fever. And with victory, Dr. Reed wrote Henry Carter... You must not forget that your own work did more to impress me with the importance of an intermediate host as the carrier of yellow fever than everything else put together. History has not forgotten Henry Rose Carter because it really never knew him. For many years, as one of a group of fighters and scientists who worked to destroy yellow fever... He could be found wherever and whenever it struck. Henry Rose Carter, who labored not for glory and acclaim, but for suffering humanity. thanks to William Ice and our cavalcade players for tonight's story. Next week, Cavalcade presents the vivacious and popular Hollywood star, Lucille Ball. Our DuPont play is an exciting adventure story of a woman spy, a general who captures her, and their long-remembered romance. Be sure to listen. Tonight's DuPont play was written by David Shaw and was based on portions of the book One Half the People by Charles Morrow, Wilson, published by William Sloan Associates. Appearing in the cast with Mr. Ice were Les Tremaine as Charles Best, 
Parker Fennelly as Mr. Whitaker, Dan Ocko as the colonel, and William Post, Jr. as the captain. Others in the cast were Denise Alexander, George Petrie, Carl Eastman, and Ann Tobin. Music for the DuPont Cavalcade was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program was directed by John Zoller. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the stage of the Belasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Don't forget Starlight Concert tonight on NBC.